What's up, kinfolk? Welcome to the number one college football show. I am your host, RJ Young. Thank you for watching. Wherever it is that you are in the world, we are doing this one here live on the YouTubes. We do this thing live on the YouTubes at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Sunday, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Tuesday, and then Saturday night, 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time-ish, mostly depending on what the slate of games looks like and when the big game for the nightcap actually kicks off and when it, frankly, finishes. We try to be right here, right now, talking about all things college football as they happen. One of the things that I really love about this show, one of the things that I really enjoy about doing this show is its immediacy to you. And one of the reasons that I get to see that is you subscribe. Like, if you're here now, it's probably because you not just subscribe, but you rung the bell so you don't miss any of the segments that we upload here. And I got to tell you, man, um, it was a fun and raucous college football weekend that we had following yet another raucous college football weekend that we had. I want to get started with just acknowledging Vanderbilt is on a two-game winning streak in SEC competition. They ain't just beating up on no FCS uh, cupcakes here. They are beating up on Alabama and Kentucky, and when you're looking at strength of schedule all of a sudden, and you're thinking about quality wins, and even if you go in for transitive properties, you got to look at Vanderbilt having knocked off the number one team in the country in Bama, there's nothing higher than that, and then beating the team that beat Ole Miss first before Ole Miss took it off to LSU. I got to tell y'all, man, it's, it's getting time to where we got to say nice things about Vanderbilt on the regular, and it's also getting time to where... We got to say nice things about Indiana on the regular, and we got to say nice things about Pittsburgh on the regular. There are 11 undefeated teams left in FBS of the 134 that play this wild and crazy sport. But I think at the top of mind right now, we have to be talking about Oregon and, and frankly, Texas, because I had a thought. Following Oregon's historic win against Ohio State, where the Buckeyes rolled in there, as the number two team in the country with a roster that it is worth, we think, about $20 million, a very well-paid coaching staff, loaded for bear, that this team was supposed to leave no doubt, according to Ryan Day, about what they are about, who they are, and what 2024 represents for them. This is supposed to be a year for which Ohio State was going to roll. And it certainly looked like they were going to do that. It looked for all the world like Ohio State was going to roll right through their schedule into the Big Ten Championship game, get that first round by, and then make their way toward winning a national championship. Oregon, in their first year in Big Ten competition, has put some change to all of that. An Oregon team that, frankly, looked anything other than worthy and ready to beat in Ohio State when they started the season. We're talking about a team that got nearly vandalized by FCS Idaho Vandals. We're talking about a team that needed a late field goal to beat Boise State and really didn't start rounding into the kind of team that we thought it was capable of being until the latter half of September. But in this weekend, where we knew that there were going to be a number of top 25 matchups that we really love, that... Oregon needed to show something, and the thing they had working for them is Austin Stadium, which I got to assume now, uh, we're going to study the acoustics of that place, and we're going to try to mimic it whenever we create new stadiums or we renovate new stadiums, because they are uh, able to achieve a 12th man advantage, unlike many that we get to see, particularly on the West Coast. I make fun of the Coliseum, because it's not always full. And it ain't always anywhere near loud, right? It, 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 matter of fact, I expect more from Los Angeles proper, if we're being honest about this. But to go up to Oregon and get a W is almost impossible. And I mean that. Like, over the last seven years, this is a program that has gone 44-3 and at Austin. And in the basically the Dan Lanning era, they have gone... 35 of 36. Like, Washington's the only team to go up there and get a win against them. That was what Ohio State was looking to bust. They were looking to go up there and show it doesn't matter who we play or where we play them. We are the Ohio State Buckeyes, and we will purport ourselves that way. And it looked like they were going to do that from the start. And by the end of the game, we got six lead changes, 
And it comes down to Ohio State having the rock at the end with an opportunity to try to get in the field goal range and win this puppy. Will Howard doesn't look at the clock, doesn't notice the clock, or is J.R. Smith out there talking about, I thought I had a timeout. Really, he slides, the clock runs out, and Oregon wins that game 32-31. to I thought it was one of the best games that we've seen all year. And frankly, I would not be shocked to find out that we see Ohio State and Oregon play two more times this season, once in the Big Ten Championship game and again in the college football playoff because that game, for me, is representative of what it was like for Alabama-Georgia 2021 when nobody was mad about both of those teams playing the SEC Championship game and those teams making it into the college football playoff and you know playing each other for the national championship. If that's what it turns out to be, for Oregon, Ohio State, I don't think any of us are going to turn anything down but our collar. It's just that that was fun. It's also reminding me that Dylan Gabriel has done this against top ranked opponents the last couple of years. And we're getting to a point where we really got to start talking about Dylan Gabriel as not just a guy that can win the Heisman Trophy, but a guy who can go win you the big game. The thing that Will Howard was supposed to do in this game that he'd done for Kansas State when they played Texas Christian in the Big 12 Championship. But when you're talking about going to get it, you got to say that this dude, Dylan Gabriel, went and got it. He also entered a really cool place. He is one of just three players in college football to have more than 17 two TD passing and one TD rushing games in the history of the sport. The others at 18 is Colin Kaepernick. And at 24 is Tim Tebow. And then right in the middle of that is Dylan Gabriel with 21. He has done this 21 times. Two passing TDs and a rushing TD. The thing that he did against Ohio State, I watched him do as the starting quarterback at Oklahoma against Texas last year. You need to go get a bucket. That guy went and got you a bucket. Running, throwing, it doesn't really matter. He was lethal against that Ohio State secondary. And Denzel Burke was getting his lunch money took, get his pockets emptied by everybody from Evan Stewart to Tez Johnson. They were deciding they were going to run down the sideline, run train on that dude. Hey, we have picked you out as the weak link and we're going to come after you over and over and over again. Remember, this is not just another Ohio State cornerback. This is the best Ohio State cornerback. This is the guy who had a first round grade who decided to come back because he ain't got no gold pants and he ain't got no Big Ten championship. And he ain't got no national championship. And that was supposed to be the standard that this group of Ohio State Buckeyes that return is chasing. They want us to know, hey, we're mostly made up of guys that chose to return because we ain't did what we set out to do yet. And then they add these guys out of the transfer portal like Quinshawn Judkins and Caleb Downs and Will Howard. And then you get outstanding play from a guy like Jeremiah Smith who still... Play great football. I thought the push-off P.I. call was weak. I, I, I'm i not calling that. We do that all the time. Uh, it's like you can call holding down on every play if you want to, but you don't. And we've seen some really bad refereeing uh, all year long, frankly. It's, it's been atrocious, even as the games have been good. But what I learned most about this Oregon team is that they will rise to the level of their competition. All right? If you're Boise State... They're going to rise to Boise State level. If you're Ohio, uh, Idaho, they're going to rise to Idaho's level. If you're the number two team in the country and a presumptive number one with a win, they're going to rise to the level of Ohio State. I think that's going to bode them well, right? Because that just means you're going to keep winning. And if they keep winning, they're going to win the Big Ten Championship and they will get the number one overall seed in the college football playoff. I think if for no other reason then we will respect the way that they did this and they got there. You could make an argument that Texas going undefeated still gets to number one, but I'm looking at what I think is a much more complete Oregon football team than Texas right now. And I'm going to go ahead and say this part. I don't think Texas wants to see Dylan Gabriel again. I really don't. I think that we have not yet seen Texas play a really, really sound and incredible football game, right? I think the closest that they've got to this against competition that we kind of sort of respect is Michigan. Okay, That defense could stay in base all day, but that's against a quarterback that couldn't throw the football. All right, They saw that again against Oklahoma. Another quarterback that couldn't throw the football. Another offense that was anemic, that, that, that needed a blood transfusion for some vitality to get into that offense. You're just not going to challenge Texas if you can't move the ball. But 
I'll tell you this, man. Oklahoma's defense, once again, gave somebody a blueprint to follow. You know now that you can confuse Quinn Ewers. You know that you can give him some looks that have him second-guessing himself and might have him holding the ball a little bit too long. And it's not because Quinn Ewers is not that good. It's frankly because defenses are getting better. I don't think that you're going to get better play out of Arch Manning. I'm not sure you get better play out of many quarterbacks in this sport right now, which is why I think, once again, if you're Texas, you don't want to see Dylan Gabriel. You know he knows you. You know that he is efficient. You know that he is going to take care of the football. You know that when he can't take a shot, he's going to be accurate with his passes. I thought that was the most underrated part of the game on Saturday night. As much as we wanted to talk about what Will Howard was not doing, what we didn't do enough of was talking about what Dylan Gabriel was. 24 of 34, 341 passing yards, and two TDs. And then they had a really great rush attack with Jordan James, who had about another 100-yard rushing performance. 115 yards on 25 carries. That'll get it done, man. I, I still think... Tess Johnson could have showed a little bit more. Terrence Ferguson could have shown a little bit more. And Trayshawn Holden, I'd have that dude running stairs for, forever. I, I, a, if you're on the football field, they got an opportunity to open this thing up really well, like wide. Because you got Evan Stewart, Tess Johnson, then you got Trayshawn. You, you are going to stretch them. You're going to find a breaking point for that defensive secondary. But because you stupid and you're going out here spitting on people, not only do you miss the game, you look like a fool. Like, if you go spit on another person, that person got every right to dislodge your teeth, to rearrange your face. That 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 Denzel Burke didn't do that. I, I look, man. I I don't care if you got a helmet on. Don't don't spit on nobody. You are asking for them to want to snap you in half. So the least the referees can do can get you up out of there because somebody's gonna hurt you. Don't go spitting on people. That's that's a bad look. But now you know Oregon can beat you without Trace John Holden for being stupid, and Jordan Burch for being hurt. So this is the second time that Oregon has played an Ohio State team without its best defensive uh, lineman and got a W. Kayvon Thibodeau was not available when they beat Ohio State in 2021 in Columbus, and Jordan Burch was one of those dudes that comes out of high school, everybody wants, he gets to pick up his national, uh, back when we did national letters of intent, because we don't do that no more. He picked his up, walked off, and said, hey, I ain't ready to make a decision. And we all... We waited on that. Ends up South Carolina, ends up transferring to Oregon. It is what it is. But I'm also really getting into the place that I, I think it's simply Oregon is a better football team than Texas. That's what I think. That's what I think. I think they're deeper too. I don't think they're as injured as Texas is at running back. I think that they have shown a little bit more in seasoning and uh, veterans, right, and wide receiver. And I also think Dylan Gabriel is operating on a sixth year where he is seeing it better than he's ever seen it in an offense run by Will Stein that will absolutely go get points if you allow it. And if you can go score 32 on Ohio State, who have been giving up 6.8 yards, or yards, points per game, you can go get whatever it is that you want to go get. Good luck with Oregon the rest of the way. And if you see them in the college football playoff, you're going to probably look at the tape and be like, how, Sway? How are we supposed to do this, Sway? Let's take a look at the chat. <laughs> 